the worst nuclear disaster you've never heard of marks its 60th anniversary in the history of nuclear disasters, it is easy to forget that the first was a radioactive explosion that occurred in 1957, located in the closed city of Chelyabinsk 40, now Ozersk, in the Ural Mountains, near the little-known village of Kishtim. Although engineering heroism has finally been applied to the smoldering sarcophagus at Chernobyl and robots are scouring the wreckage of Fukushima, the disaster, according to many reports, continues to spew radioactivity into the environment and languish hostages. Late in the evening of September 29, 1957, residents of the Chelyabinsk region in the southern Urals noticed unusual bluish-purple colors in the sky. In the regional press there was speculation about the polar lights, which appeared exceptionally far to the south. However, in just a few days, the government began a flurry of activity around the military zone, where the Mayak nuclear facility was located. Peasants had to slaughter their cattle, bury their crops, and plow their farmland. More than 20 villages, with more than 11,000 people, were evacuated and completely destroyed. No official statements were made about these orders, but anyone could guess for themselves that there had been a major accident at Mayak. Mayak was established in 1946, and by 1949 it produced the first Soviet atomic bomb. After that first success, Moscow demanded more and more bombs, and less and less time to build them. Mayak did well. But there was a price to pay. As a result of neglecting basic safety standards, 17,245 workers overdosed on radiation between 1948 and 1958. The dumping of radioactive waste into a nearby river from 1949 to 1952 caused several outbreaks of radiation sickness in downstream villages. Thus, area residents were familiar with the invisible danger emanating from the secret facility. None of us were supposed to know anything about it, and had it not been for a series of untimely revelations, we probably never would have known. This is called the Kishtim disaster, and until the mid-1980s the official location of the city was not even marked on the map. Only the winds blowing from the north in the aftermath gave any indication of its existence. In the early morning hours of September 29, 64 years ago, a tanker of nuclear waste exploded at the Mayak Chemical Combine, the main Soviet center for reprocessing spent nuclear fuel that still operates today. The fallout covered more than 200 towns and villages and exposed 272,000 people to radiation, a small fraction of whom were quietly evacuated over the next two years. According to the government, up to 400,000 people continue to grapple with the ongoing contamination from the accident, which has been exacerbated by inadequate waste management practices and the continued negligence of officials. Over time, people living near Mayak have become a kind of radioactive waste, Nadezhda Kutapova, a longtime advocate for area residents, told Greenpeace. Like its two younger brothers, the Kishtim explosion was born of secrecy and nurtured by naivety. Moscow hid the details of the accident for nearly three decades. It first came to light in 1976, when biologist scientist Georges Medvedev was the first to publish his suspicions that the government was not telling the whole truth. The material was not accepted. He was kicked out of the country. Later, the circumstances under which the official version of the accident emerged were almost accidental. The Soviet government included detailed information about it in a report on Chernobyl that it submitted to the UN in 1986, finally revealing its secrecy. By now, Moscow's version of the disaster had taken on a hackneyed appearance, a faulty cooling system and an uncontrolled reaction inside the reactor of uranium and plutonium led to overheating and an explosion. Even the cleanup of Kishtim was offered to frighten locals with euphemisms and understatement. The post-war population, mostly women and children, were given rags and mops and no protective gear to clean up what they were told was dirt after the explosion of the coal boiler in the village of Kishtim. In fact, the accident occurred a few kilometers below, in the closed town of Ozersk. In the Soviet Union, this, as they say now, fake version caught on. But over the years, the danger and scale of what it came to signify has only grown. For decades after Mayak was founded, it dumped untreated radioactive waste directly into the nearby Tekka River to produce plutonium for Soviet atomic bombs. Russian regulators claim that the plant stopped dumping waste in 2004 after a lawsuit and criminal charges ousted the plant's scandal plague director. But various investigations by environmental nonprofits have since questioned this claim. The Russian state nuclear corporation Rosatom, meanwhile, refuses to respond to specific allegations of continued dumping, instead making general statements that Mayak operates within environmental guidelines and that the Tekka meets sanitary standards. 
Indeed, because the river is already so polluted, establishing that further pollution may seem merely academic. If you trace the northern course of the river, you can map mortality and disease, record numbers of chromosomal anomalies, birth defects, and cancer, well above the national average, mark every new village it passes. Only in 2008, more than half a century after the discharges began, did Rosatom undertake the evacuation of some rural settlements fed by this radioactive floodwater, but only partially and only half. The village of Musliumovo, located in Kunashaksky district of Chelyabinsk region, was severely affected by the consequences of the discharge of liquid radioactive waste into the Teka River. However, there was no hurry to resettle the residents. For many decades, Musliumovo was the closest settlement on the Teka River to the site of radioactive waste dumped by the Mayak plant. Local residents believed that they were in no hurry to resettle them for an experiment on the long-term effects of radiation on humans. The population of the village of Musliumovo, which had long borne the brunt of the contamination, was resettled just two kilometers upriver. The inhabitants of the settlement were issued certificates of residence of the irradiated zone, entitling them to some simple benefits. In 1994, the head of the Chelyabinsk region administration issued an order on resettlement of residents of the village and station Musliumovo of Kunashaksky district, a program of voluntary resettlement of the villagers was developed. However, no money was found for the resettlement. Only at the end of 2006 Rosatom finally allocated funds for resettlement of residents. In 2007, near Musliumovo station, just two kilometers from the contaminated river, the construction of a new settlement, Novovoslyumovo, began. The residents had a choice, move into the houses built, or get 1 million rubles per family with the right to move themselves wherever they want. The resettlement of the village ended in 2013, more than 60 years after the river was polluted. The houses of the resettled residents were demolished. But even getting these benefits through the local courts turned out to be a dangerous business. Kudapova, who had long fought the Chelyabinsk officialdom on behalf of the Mayak victims, had become an irritant that the government was tired of listening to. In 2015, the Ministry of Justice declared her legal aid group Planet of Hope a foreign agent. In the months that followed, official Russian TV channels began to build up a panic that she herself might be a spy. Later that year, she fled the country to Paris. Many residents of Musliumovo and other contaminated villages did not go anywhere at all. When it came time to move, bureaucrats would not accept their papers or medical records, condemning them to death because of clerical errors. Others decided that what Rosatom was offering was a bad deal. Leaving the homes their families have lived in for generations for paltry sums to rebuild in tiny cramped apartments was considered a bad deal by many. Regardless of where they live, however, they continue to be visited by doctors who keep detailed records of their declining strength and health. They say those who live along the river have a cancer rate 3.6 times higher than the national average and a rate of birth defects 25 times higher than elsewhere in the country. The miscarriage rate continues to rise, and preterm babies are born with limb and organ malformations. Many of the remaining adults suffer from swollen lymph nodes so severe that their words are unintelligible to visiting doctors. Doctors conclude that the strontium-90 leaking through the river has settled in the bones of the population. Even in the shadow of these disturbing facts, Mayak has much of the waste left over from the Soviet nuclear legacy to process. In many ways, it was only after the Chernobyl accident that the government of the USSR realized that it was possible to tell about the accident at the Mayak Combine as well. There were victims, evacuees, and heroic liquidators of the consequences of the accident. The latter had no rights or benefits until the details of the accident were declassified. I think nobody will fully know how many people died as a result of the accident, especially since nearly 55 years have passed since this dreadful event occurred. It is not known how many of the tens of thousands of emergency workers died in the following years. The consequences of environmental contamination will haunt both the inhabitants of nearby areas and the descendants of the resettled inhabitants for a long time to come. Almost all of the spent fuel from the now-defunct Soviet nuclear submarine fleet went to Mayak and saved northern Russian ports and Western Europe from a disaster of another kind. More recently, decades of accumulated nuclear fuel from the Soviet fleet, left to rot in Andreeva Bay, began to be sent for reprocessing at Mayak, suggesting that the once-doomed plant could atone for past sins. But too much of Beacon's history a history written in the sickness and ugliness of its witnesses has become known only by accident and chance. If the country wants to give this once uncharted territory any absolution, Rosatom must provide full transparency in return. Will they be up to the task?
If you were interested, thank the author by putting a like. And also do not forget to subscribe so as not to miss the outputs of even more interesting videos of my channel. Turn on notifications by clicking on the bell and share this video with your friends. What else interesting can you add to this video? Write in the comments, it will be interesting to read.